Hi, I'm Doris Purchase, and welcome to Beyond the Frame, a podcast created just for you by Propeller Art Gallery, artists empowering artists in Toronto. Together, we'll take a deep dive into the hearts and minds of working visual artists today and their practice. In each episode, you will hear illuminating and intimate explorations of all things art, and you'll hear it in the artist's own voice. We'll talk process, inspiration, challenges, and much more. Everything you've ever wanted to know about art making or about the artists themselves happens right here. So let's sit back and have a listen, shall we? Today we welcome Lisa Johnson. Which ism is it? Under which ism would you classify your work? I feel that isms are a little bit an old-fashioned way of looking at art. Isms were kind of part of the 19th, 20th century when movements became, you know, more and more segmented. Each one was sort of trying to say something that had never been said before, and then it got to this kind of almost absurd point where, you know, people talked about the end of painting because, you know, as if, you know, we've run out of isms, you know, there's no point. But I, I think now there's so much good painting and going on and and everything is possible. You can pull from different approaches all within one painting using whatever techniques you, you might need to use to say what you want to say. So does that make me a postmodernist? Maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, I, I kind of like when a, a mark or a gesture reminds me of of a painting or a painter, that connection to painting history. You know, I mean, if I really had to to explain what I'm doing, I guess I'm I usually start with landscape as a as the basis, and then you know some desire to capture an experience of a place, the spirit of of, of a place, and then it it often veers off into abstract territory as I sort of continue a kind of improvisational approach, a kind of dance with the paint. So I'm not sure what ism that is, but. Who's your muse? Influencers, educators, mentors, who has greatly inspired you? In terms of, I guess, influential teachers, Tom Dean taught painting at the Ontario College of Art, even though he was a sculptor. But I learned a lot from him about space, negative and positive space. In terms of drawing, Richard Robertson was a real master of of teaching drawing, and drawing continues to be a really important part of my practice today. In terms of, well, if I talk about a muse, I guess music is one of my main muses, and looking at, you know, experiencing landscape, I don't know if that's a muse, but that's, that's where it often starts. But most influence, I would say, is from looking at the history of painting. When I, when I was in my 20s, I backpacked around Europe, and I saw, you know, all this great art around you know, in the museums. And that is something that I, you know, I continue to look at art. I continue to learn from, you know, artists like Rembrandt and Degas and Morandi and Stine and Auerbach and and then the more contemporary stuff or recent stuff, I guess, the abstract expressionists I'm pretty influenced by like Joan Mitchell and de Kooning and and so on. But yeah, I, I'm always looking at stuff and, and trying to learn more. And of course, there's always Tom Thompson um, and David Milne, you know, uh, uh, Carmichael, uh, especially when I'm out doing plein air painting, which is painting on location. You know, I, I like to see what they've done with the landscape. Materials matter. What are your chosen favorite tools and preferred medium? I use oil paint on canvas for the larger studio works. And then when I'm out doing on plein air painting, I'm usually painting on birch panels or with oil again and do a little bit of sculpture, but mostly I'm painting. Slump secrets. What methods do you employ to get yourself out of a slump? Usually putting on some kind of music gets me going, but also drawing gets me back to my, what I call my art brain. If I've been too consumed with non-art things, I also find that if I just start writing, the ideas start to flow, and the next thing you know, I'm on my feet with a brush in hand. You know, sometimes I'll just start writing anything, you know, like, what am I thinking? And then 
before you know it, I'm sketching and then I, I'm on my way. But if I'm discouraged or something about what I'm doing, sometimes there's nothing you can do except just keep going through it. And even if you think what you're doing is horrible, sometimes later on you realize that you had to go through that fire in order to create something powerful. And, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you're doing. You don't, And, and sometimes the best stuff comes out of a time when you think it, it's not good because you're actually learning something new and your brain is trying to absorb some new idea and it can feel that you're lost, but in fact you're finding something new. In the beginning, so tell me a bit about your process. Do you have a bag of tricks, lucky talismans, or habits? Where do you start? And more importantly, when do you stop? My ideal painting day would be to go out plein air painting on location in some inspiring place and then go back into the studio and paint from my recollection. I don't like to use photography as that sort of seems to confine me to a a view. Um, I'd rather let the the subconscious impressions of a place, the experience of a place, you know, the how did it feel, the wind and the water and the light and it somehow comes th- come out through gestural marks and you know the more subconscious experiences. So in terms of how do I start, I often start with a charcoal gestural drawing and then I follow that with a thinned earth tone, so raw umber, burnt sienna, burnt umber, something like that, rubbed on with a rag and then I start to see things appearing and you know, sometimes you don't know what you're doing until you start to see visions. And then and then I'll start to do an underpainting. So I'm sort of blocking in very loosely the tones of the composition. And then building up on that, I add more color, still keeping those values there. And then um, more, you know, thicker paint, more impasto and so on. And then at some point, I'm often, you know, start to push and pull with the space and In fact, the forms, sometimes I start to make them dissolve a bit and so that you start to break down that form and it gets starts to get more abstract. And at that point you're you're really looking at the painting as a painting as opposed to, you know, being concerned with whether it's representing something. So it the painting in and of itself is what sort of starts to take over and what colors and marks do you need to make to to create visual excitement and to make it complete. Calling all emo. What do you wish people to think or feel when they contemplate your work? I'm not thinking about what I want people to feel. I'm just hoping that it will move people in some way, make some kind of emotional connection. But it's better if I don't think about the end result when I'm painting and try to keep focused on the process. The struggle is real. Talk to me about your biggest challenges as an artist. What methods do you use to overcome these challenges? Getting into the studio is sometimes a challenge when there are competing things to do, family life, the the business of a painting career, the, the you know, other responsibilities. But once I get in there, I can paint intensively for long hours. Um, but it sometimes takes me a while to get going. I find the best way is to start writing or drawing or looking at art. Um, and then all of a sudden there's that impulse to, to attack the canvas, I guess. The other challenge is, you know, self-doubt. And I, I think a lot of artists probably struggle with that. I tend to question everything I've done and tend to always see what, what I should do next. Never quite satisfied. But I think that's that's just part of the process. And I think art making... It, is all about the doing, the the act of painting is what it's about, and and that's what keeps you going. So trying to learn and get better and never sort of resting on your laurels. Uh, as soon as I think I've got something figured out, I tend to want to question that. I'm envious of people who have a way to paint that they always follow, but I, I can't seem to do that. I get bored if I'm not learning something new, and um, for me it's it's about the questions, I think, more than the answers. And maybe, you know, the fact that I'm constantly searching is what 
keeps me going, keeps me interested. Maybe if I got to a point where I felt like I knew everything, I, I, I would say, okay, well, there's nothing else to do, so I'll stop now. But I feel like it's a lifelong pursuit. Picture perfect. In your opinion, what constitutes a perfect piece of art? And what qualities in your own work would you signify as a perfect work? For example, perfect composition, confident brushstrokes, illustrating a concept, or something else altogether. I don't think of perfection in terms of art. If you want to know what I think makes a piece of art great, I would say for me it's that I feel some kind of emotional charge. Whether you're looking in a room full of Roscoe's or or a, a tiny Rembrandt, it hits you and you feel something, you know, almost transcendent. And that's what I want to feel in my art as I'm doing it, that I can get lost in that moment of creative energy. And you feel something that you can't express in words. You know, like a piece of music, I prefer imperfection. Pablo Casals playing the Bach cello suites. It's not perfect and polished. It's raw and true. And that's that's the kind of music that I kind of go after. Or Maria Callas, that thrilling emotional intensity. For me, perfection is a bit of a trap. When you think you can do something that you can control, when I think what I'm doing is in, is in control, it's a bit of a, of a danger. I, I prefer to see the process the artist went through and I prefer the questions to the answers, I think. Art Speak. How do you feel about titling, discussing, and explaining your work? I'm a bit wary about talking about my art, although this is kind of a different experience and I'm and I'm quite enjoying it. I tend to think about painting as a way to express without words, so it seems a bit weird to explain explain it in words. But I do love to talk to other painters about painting. I don't get to do that enough. For my liking. Um, that's why I'm really excited about um, a residency I'm doing in September in Puch Cove, where I will be with quite a few other landscape painters, and I'm looking forward to being able to talk shop with people. In terms of titling, it's something I, I also struggle with. I don't want to box people into my interpretation of a painting, and I'd rather something a bit open, open-ended and poetic. Um, but that that's something that I do kind of angst about. Heavy metal or classical? What do you listen to while you work? Or is silence your thing? Up until about 17 years of age, I studied dance. That was my way of ex- expressing myself creatively. When I paint, I think the same thing happens. I feel the emotion, the rhythm, and the dynamic of the music. And that comes out in, in what I do. You know, I'm always listening to music when I paint, and I have a, a really wide range of musical taste. Probably top on the list is Bach, especially played by Glenn Gould. But I can also put on Tanya Tagak or Tragically Hip or Sarah Harm or Joni Mitchell. The funny, they're all Canadians. Hmm. But I also like opera or jazz or oratorio. This past year, I was listening to Mozart's Requiem a lot. Depends on my mood, and I'm pretty moody. So usually I like something that has some kind of spiritual impact. As I said, Maria Callas, intensity, that sort of thing. But I can just as easily turn on some Led Zeppelin if I really need a a charge. So it depends on my mood, I guess. Why for art, though? Why do you make art? I guess I've always had a creative need, just seems like my brain works like that, making lateral connections between things and very aware of my thoughts and feelings and the need to express those things somehow. You know, as as a kid, you know, I was writing poetry and I used to dance and make up songs and act out dramas with my sister, who coincidentally became an actress, Brooke Johnson. But eventually I settled on painting as the best outlet for my creative impulses. Maybe I like this sort of act of creating a landscape of my own, you know, some uh, another world that I can get lost into. Overall, I, I feel that the arts are what makes life worth living, and I guess that's 
why I do it. The best part of human nature, I think, is the ability to create and imagine something better. When I'm painting, I'm really lost in my own world, making some kind of meaning and looking for answers, or maybe just more questions. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Frame, a PAG podcast. To hear more episodes and to view the artist's works, please visit www.propellerartgallery.ca. Hosted by Doris Purchase, produced by Tracy Thompson, and recorded at the Orange Lounge Studio in Toronto. Also, the Propeller Art Gallery recognizes the presence of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron-Wendat Nations. We acknowledge we are hosted on land governed by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, the Two-Row Wampum Treaty, and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are committed to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you for listening.